morning. Thanks uh, very much for coming, everyone. Uh, I want to offer a special thanks to uh, ICS and the Engineering School for hosting our institute, uh, Sam Malik of the um, Institute for Software Research for co-sponsoring this event with us. Uh, special personal thanks also to uh, Debbie Broadbeck and uh, Kat Rupp and uh, Matt and Philbert and especially to our CPRI fellow April Sather, who you'll hear from more from later and without whom this event could not have taken place. Uh, we're going to get underway, but I wanted to uh, invite our Dean Marios, I've been here three years, I still can't pronounce his last name, uh, to come up and welcome you. Thank you, Brian. My name is Marios Papa FMI. I can pronounce my last name. <laughs> uh, I'm the Dean for Information, the School of Information and Computer Sciences. Uh, I, I want to say a big thank you to all the colleagues and all the uh, partners from the, the community who are participating in this event. Uh, welcome. Uh, I was looking at the program. It's a very exciting day. I will try to show my face uh, during the day. Uh, I'm sure you will, you will uh, enjoy uh, the program immensely. Uh, a big thank you to Brian for organizing the event. And of course a big thank you to April and all the crew from CPRI for doing such a wonderful job. Welcome. Uh, I should let you move on with the program. Brian. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. I uh, want to get right to our keynote speaker, uh, but just a couple of administrative announcements. As you probably know, we're going to have lunch at the end of the program out on the deck, assuming the weather cooperates. And we'll also have some uh, posters and some demos of some of the exciting work that's going on here, so make sure that you save time to see those. You probably have seen that the bathroom is straight out here to the, through the second glass doors to the right. And as always on this campus, apologies for the parking situation. The news I can give you though is it's only going to get worse. So uh, please keep coming anyway. Uh, the Institute actually has a couple of exciting things coming up on June 18th. Uh, we have an event in the evening co-sponsored by uh, the law firm of Newmeyer and Dillian who have been great supporters of us. It'll be at the Cove, and it'll cover uh, the new California uh, Consumer Privacy Act and the new uh, Internet of Things privacy law in California and the European uh, General Data Protection Regulation and asking the rhetorical question, to which the answer is obviously no, can you comply with all of these three things at the same time? <laughs> but we'll get as close as we can to explaining how you might do that. Also very exciting, particularly for anyone who is um, here as part of a small or medium-sized California company, uh, the Institute has combined forces with the United States Department of Commerce and the California state of California to create a cybersecurity trade mission to Singapore and Malaysia in the fall. So if you're a California company, depending on your size, you can get dramatically subsidized rates to go on this event. and. Uh, you know, people have different views of how effective the U.S. government is these days, um, but the Commerce Department is actually quite effective at uh, arranging one-on-one -on -one meetings, arranging group meetings, arranging events for meetings with the Singapore government, the Malaysian government, the companies there. It's very uh, flexible in terms of the agenda and what we can, we can schedule. So watch our uh, mailing list for that. We're going to have a big announcement about that, and there will be a link that shows how you can apply to participate in that. Um, uh, that will be coming in the next couple days. And speaking of our mailing list, you've all opted in to that uh, uh, by signing up, but you, it's very easy to opt out once you uh, get, get the first newsletter. So hopefully you won't want to, but uh, if you do, we've made that pretty easy. So enough of my yakking. Um, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Kevin Fu. Kevin is an Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Michigan, where he directs the Security and Privacy Research Group and the Archimedes Center for Medical Device Security. His research focuses on analog cybersecurity and his embedded security research uh, interests span from the physics of cybersecurity through the operating system <laughs> to human factors, which we all know are some of the most dangerous uh, factors of all cybersecurity. <laughs> His past research projects include MEMS sensor security, which I'm sure he'll explain, pacemaker, defibrillator security, cryptographic file systems, web authentication, RFID security and privacy, wirelessly powered sensors, medical device safety, and public policy 
for information security and privacy. So in other words, Kevin can crack your encryption, clone your credit card, crash your car, and kill you. <laughs> so I would listen to what he has to say. <laughs> Kevin served as a visiting scientist at the Food and Drug Administration, the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at Harvard Medical School and at MIT. Kevin also apparently has a 164-year plan for medical device security. So for those of you whose consciousness makes it to the singularity, you got something to look forward to. Um, but for, while we're all waiting for that happy day, please join me in welcoming Kevin Fu. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, great to be here. So we're going to get right into the fun, physics. Um, so uh, how many people have heard of side channels? Okay. Oh, a little more than half the room. Okay, good. So um, I'd say uh, 2018 was the year of side channels in computer security research when uh, a big team of folks discovered some fundamental flaws in computer architecture that showed how you could extract secrets from computers because of some just bizarre things going on with speculative execution. Um, but that is taking information out of a computer through an uh, unintended pathway. Today we're going to talk about injecting information into a computer uh, using things like sound waves, radio waves, um, and, and other interesting tricks uh, to damage what's, what would be called the integrity property. So in um, uh, undergraduate computer science, uh, computing uh, security cores, you'll usually hear about confidentiality, integrity, authenticity, uh, and a few other key properties. Um, but today, again, we're going to focus on how to protect what's going into a computer through the sensors, and how do we know the sensors getting actual good data that you're going to make decisions on for things like, uh, oh, autonomous vehicles, um, uh, pacemakers and defibrillators. Uh, so there's my research team on one of the autonomous uh, buses at Michigan. Uh, you'll find it in sensors and drones uh, for flight st uh, stability control. And then even in Washington, D.C., I believe this mall in Washington, D.C. had the first underwater uh, autonomous uh, robot, but I don't think that was by uh, design. Okay, so to warm things up, um, I want to first talk about the precursor to security problems, and that would be reliability problems. Um, anytime you hear about a reliability problem, uh, you can pretty much guarantee that two to three years later, there are going to be uh, just a host of computer security issues. Uh, uh, I'd say the, one of the best examples would be the Brohammer. Anyone who works in computer architecture is going to be familiar with Brohammer, uh, which is a way of extracting information from computer memory because of some subtle uh, flaws in the circuitry. Um, but I want to go through this one example of, too loud, okay. I can step back. I, okay, I'll try to spit uh, proportionately on the front row. Uh, okay. uh, so I want to first go through a video from, this is about a decade ago from the New York Times about this, um, I think he's either Russian or Ukrainian, uh, but watch what happens to his broiler. Let me play this video and hopefully, uh, hopefully the sound works. Let's see how it goes. We call your phone now. His phone rings. And his broiler spontaneously turns on. So I tried to buy this particular Magic Chef oven for my lab. Um, I couldn't find it, but I have a pretty good guess on what's going on. Um, why, why would, you know, a cell phone ringing cause your boiler to spontaneously ignite? That's not part of the remote start feature of this oven. Um, what I surmise is going on is that there's a little piece of wire from the broil button going into a microcontroller that's controlling the ignition, and it has a length. And because it has a length, it has a resonant frequency like high school physics. And so if you send in radio waves at that resonance, you're likely to get a missense event. The microcontroller is likely seeing a false key press. Um, don't know what happened in this case, but this sort of inspired us to go a little bit deeper, um, looking at where do we in computer science create these wonderful digital abstractions that really hide a lot of the nastiness of the physics. Um, so vibration, acoustics, radio frequency, uh, even light and heat can cause bizarre errors in computer systems, often uh, uh, materializing as reliability issues. Um, but when you can, as an adversary, tune it to be on demand and intentional, suddenly it becomes a, a security threat. Uh, and in particular, it can lead to consequences of sensor spoofing, um, which, uh, you know, if it's just a health monitor, it's not a big deal. 
but if it's something that's closed loop like an insulin pump or a pacemaker or an autonomous vehicle or something kinetic, uh, th then you can have some serious consequences. Um, so to warm things up, um, uh, literally, uh, I want to take a look at this example of a thermocouple. Um, so one of my research investigators, uh, um, uh, Dr. Sarah Rampazzi, she's uh, using uh, just a very simple antenna that we just bought off the internet, uh, and she placed it deliberately next to a thermocouple. Uh, a thermocouple is a popular way to measure temperature um, uh, in, in various industrial settings, and this is a pretty high-end uh, temperature gauge. Um, but if you look closely, um, well, first a little bit about the physics. The way a thermocouple works is um, it's just got a little two pieces, it's bimetal, it's got two pieces of metal, uh, and the heat differential between either ends of the wire create a small voltage potential. And then the computer can measure that voltage and interpolate what temperature it is uh, based on some kind of uh, ground truth. Um, the trick is, this is not actually temperature. This is, this is measuring a voltage and guessing that it represents the actual temperature in the room. So if you look closely in this image in my lab, it's negative 1,847 degrees Fahrenheit in my lab uh, at the moment. Um, and if, if, you do, <laughs> if you do the math, that's actually below absolute zero. So it's negative 770 Kelvin. Um, so we call this the absolute zero day attack. Um, um, but you, you have to imagine there's some programmer out there who just wrote some code without guardrails on their code where they just let any old voltage bleed right through into the software. And so you should not be allowing something below you know, uh, 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 you know, the, the singularity of the universe uh, to propagate into your software. So imagine if this were hooked up into a closed loop feedback system. So this is just sort of giving you an idea of that we've got sensors all around us, and the software doesn't do a very robust job at getting rid of the, the crazy data. Now imagine if an adversary does this intentionally. Um, where you're going to find thermocouples, you'll find them in things like cryogenic chambers. Uh, for uh, controlling the temperature of uh, embryos. Um, so you can imagine you have a, a cooling system that um, uh, regulates itself, uh, turning it on and off when it senses that the temperature is rising. This is why you need to keep radios away from thermocouples because they could accidentally induce a false voltage. Um, so I'm gonna uh, talk about some older research before we get into some of the more modern stuff. Um, this, this originally started as what we thought was a one-off where um, we discovered how you could use uh, radio waves um, to uh, inject false data into sensors. Um, over the last several years, we've discovered it's actually very generalizable, uh, but let me give you just a, a flavor of this. Um, so, uh, pop quiz, it's uh, uh, you know, almost 10 in the morning, so which one's the real cardiac signal? Uh, is it the sinus rhythm uh, on the left, A, or is it the flat line on the right, B? Um, so who had, who's had coffee this morning? <laughs> um, so um, who, who votes for A as the real signal? I prefer, prefer A. And who votes for B? Okay, those are the hackers. Um, so, so the real answer in this case is B, and the context is important. So imagine that you are a pacemaker, and your job is to pace the heart when there isn't a normal sinus rhythm. That means you have a sensor that's looking for basically a flat line. And when you see the flat line, you send an artificial shock to the heart to cause it to beat. <laughs> Um, so if somebody were to inject a false sinus rhythm, uh, the pacemaker would just turn itself off uh, because it's trying to save power, and that would be undesirable. So um, there are a huge amount of technologies coming out of the computer security research community. Um, uh, I mean, network security, there's just, uh, you know, thousands of companies now. Um, a lot of the technology, we know what to do, um, and it's, it's a matter of executing. But where there's a big mystery for me is the sensor side of the story because it's as far as I can tell, when my students look at um, where sensors are inside um, these closed-loop feedback systems, we, we very rarely find security designed in um, because uh, it's, it's out of sight and out of mind. So let me give an example of what can go wrong. Um, we're we're going to talk about this microphone in front of me. Um, so this microphone uh, has a condenser or sometimes it just has a little cardboard tube in it wrapped around with some magnet wire that vibrates proportional to the, the wave front of the uh, the pressure waves coming from my acoustics of my mouth, and then they create small voltage potentials going down this wire to an amplifier, digitized, and then um, put out over the ceiling. Um, but the, here you see this red wire between the microphone and the amplifier. It has a length, therefore it has a resonant frequency. Therefore, if you emit certain RF patterns, you're likely to hear something on the microphone. Now, um, those of you who maybe went to school in the 1990s or earlier, uh, might recall a speaker walking up to the podium and you hear this right when the, uh, 
uh, the, the, like the first generation uh, cell phones are kicking in. Uh, that was RF interference latching onto the microphones at the resonance. Um, so um, we're going to take a look at what, do you, what if you do this deliberately rather than by accident. So um, the way this is solved today from a reliability perspective is imagine, so this is a, an illustration of a four-year transform. We're looking at the, the spectrum of the uh, radio waves uh, coming in from low frequencies on the left uh, to high frequencies on the right. You can kind of think of it as like an equalizer in music. Um, so if you're expecting very low frequency tones, like the male fundamental frequency tops out around, I think, 180 hertz, and then you get all the harmonics uh, from an acoustic standpoint. <laughs> Um, so you can build circuits that are really, really dirt simple to f filter out all the high frequencies. So all this high frequency stuff goes away, goes away very easily. Trouble is when you get interference coming in in what's known as the base band, the expected range of frequencies for your normal signal, it becomes much harder for the circuits to filter it out before it gets to the software stack. And, and so that's what we're going to look at right now. What happens when we get this interference in the expected band um, and, and what can we do about it? Uh, so Dennis, uh, one of my postdocs, built this um, uh, uh, dipole antenna from leftover construction materials in my house. And then uh, he's sending out radio waves using a, a software programmable radio, a USRP, uh, a very common uh, utility in laboratories. And um, he's got a little USB webcam with a microphone, and he's recording what the computer heard in the room as we're playing these radio waves. So uh, it's about a meter distance between the USRP. Uh, and the uh, microphone from this now disassembled uh, webcam. And you're about to hear uh, what the room sounded like uh, when he played these radio waves in this completely silent room. All right. So uh, my postdoc uh, introduced me to Weezer uh, that year. I still don't quite know what they do. Um, but... Uh, uh, this was a completely silent room, and yet the music was being picked up by the microphone. So what was going on here from an intuitive sense is, um, you've probably heard of the, the apocryphal story of you know, the kid with braces picking up AM radio stations. That's basically what's going on here. Uh, we trick the microphone into becoming an unintentional radio demodulator. Uh, it has to do with some of the nonlinearities of the circuitry, uh, but th that's sort of a really high level of how it works. It's basically become a radio receiver. Um, so for the, uh, uh, I'm imagining you don't want math this early in the morning. Um, but what's basically going on is that when you send in um, interference to one of these nonlinear systems, it makes copies of the signal. Uh, it goes to an amplifier. And so um, you'll see uh, we send in some signals at 826 megahertz, which just happened to be the resonant frequency of this wire. Um, and we, we know that from doing some frequency sweeping and some testing with the wire. Um, and when you send in the signal into this microphone, it, it creates copies of that signal at all the sums and differences of all of its frequency components. Um, but because of the magic of um, uh, some of the filters built into the microphones, um, remember, uh, microphones are really good at getting rid of the high frequency noise. So it just filters out all the high frequency uh, uh, copies. And what you're left with is effectively a demodulated one kilohertz signal at the very end. And so uh, this microphone system is tricked into behaving like a radio receiver that's tuned uh, for this particular frequency. And then it's given to the microprocessor, which just blindly accepts it as truth. Um, so, so that's just an illustration of uh, how a sensor can be fairly um, easily and reliably fooled into delivering false information to a microprocessor. Let's talk about application to medical devices just briefly. So a pacemaker regulates the heartbeat with very small pacing shocks, uh, and it does so using a sensor. These are um, electrodes woven in through a sacrificed blood vessel uh, for both sensing directly inside the cardiac chamber and then also emitting these small shocks. So you have multiple uh, electrodes uh, implanted in your body. Um, and it just turns out that um, this is a single heartbeat, the QRS complex. Um, every single heartbeat, if you were to do a four-year transform on it, most of the spectrum is between about 10 and 1,000 hertz. So fairly low frequency. And so what you'll find in the design of these medical devices, they have all this really fancy analog circuit stuff to get rid of the low frequency below 10 hertz and everything above 1,000 hertz is just wiped away. Um, so if you send an RF, RF interference within that baseband, it becomes very difficult for the pacemaker to filter out that noise and it can get confused. Um, so to test this theory of could we deliver um, a false sinus normal heart rhythm 
uh, to a pacemaker, um, we used uh, high, uh, high end tools like a kitty litter box. Um, but actually, there's um, an ANSI PCI 69 standard for the uh, salinity of the human body, and that's the best we have right now to simulate a human torso short of uh, living tissue. So um, we just have highly calibrated saline solution with a pacemaker inside of it, and we also have a pacemaker taped on a wall uh, using, yet again, leftover copper piping from my house to send an RF uh, to, the, um, to the pacemaker. So um, I have a lot more to cover, so I'm just going to talk about the, the one image on the left. Um, the first thing we thought of was, well, you know, let's send in a sine wave that's pulsed on and off every one second, because that sounds like a 60 beats per minute kind of thing. Um, and so sure enough, if you send in uh, uh, a sine wave at pretty much any frequency, uh, ideally at resonance, and then pulse it on and off very quickly every second, it gets misinterpreted as a 60 beats per minute heart rate. And you can know this because the screenshot on the bottom left is what the physician sees in the operating room. And I'll, I'll try to decode what's going on with these symbols. Um, the green symbol, VP, means ventricular pace. That means the pacemaker is delivering a shock because it senses there's no heart rhythm. When we send in these three pulses of interference, the pacemaker turns itself off. It says, uh, ventricular sense, purple VS, meaning, oh, uh, this patient is norm beating their heart just normally, therefore we can go into a low frequency mode, uh, you know, shut off the clock, shut off the circuits of the computer that's drawing a lot of energy, save power, make the device last longer, uh, because we don't need to. Uh, the patient uh, is able to pace themselves. Uh, the moment we turn off the interference, the um, pacemaker resumes, it wakes up again, goes into its high frequency mode, and, and begins to pace the patient. Um, we couldn't find any volunteers uh, to do this, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, the physicians we work with uh, uh, said that if this were to happen in a real patient, um, their blood pressure would immediately drop to zero and would likely faint um, uh, as, as you would no longer have oxygenated blood. Uh, but as soon as the interference goes away, the pacemaker uh, resumes functioning uh, normally. Um, so the bad news is this is theoretically possible. The good news is in practice it's really hard to do um, because the body just naturally absorbs a lot of these particular frequencies because we're basically bags of salt water. Um, so if you're further away than just five centimeters, it becomes very difficult in practice at reasonable power levels where you, you're not going to you know, um, fry yourself. Uh, to uh, uh, induce these, these uh, false sensations. However, if it's a body-worn device, if it's something outside the body, like an insulin pump, we haven't tested that, and um, I suspect it'd be a lot easier to cause interference because you don't have as much of the human tissue near it to absorb the RF. Okay, so that was old stuff about using radio waves. Um, I want to get into some of the acoustic uh, uh, side of this as well. Um, a few years later, we, we discovered you could use very similar techniques to fool... Uh, MEMS sensors. So MEMS is a microelectrical mechanical system. You can kind of think of it as like a sensor, a mechanical structure shrunk down into silicon. And you can buy them as a chip. It's, it's very popular. You'll have billions of them now. Uh, you'll find them in your smartphone, especially for the accelerometer and the gyroscope. So if you ever wonder how you go to portrait and landscape mode, it's because there's an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and it's sensing the orientation. Um, so I have a little video here where uh, what we're about to do uh, is, yet again, uh, this is some leftover construction material from my house, uh, some insulation uh, to use as a safety chamber, because the, the, these sounds are ear-piercing and can damage your hearing. Uh, and then inside this box uh, is a Fitbit, and this Fitbit is uh, just sitting next to a $5 tweeter speaker, and uh, we've chosen a very particular sine wave to play next to the Fitbit. And just, it has a Bluetooth link to this phone, and watch what happens to the step count as we play this sound that I'll play for you now. It's, it's sort of an annoying sound, so just be prepared. It's around 11 kilohertz. 11.53 to be exact. You just barely hear that. 81, 82, 83. Um, so uh, my students thought that we could just sell ringtones to create a funding model for the lab, um, which, which might work. You can get about 5,000 steps a day this way. Um, but the reason this is working is we're vibrating um, a small accelerometer that's built into every health fitness device in the universe, uh, and it causes a missense um, because they're again these sensors are not actually sensing acceleration; they're sensing a proxy for whatever they're trying to measure, and a vibration is one other way to trick it into seeing a false reality. Um, so to dive a little deeper into why this is working, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about history. 
Um, so some of you might be aware of um, the uh, sort of 1970s, 1980s um, phone freaking. Uh, uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were most famous for this. One of their first products before starting Apple uh, was a blue box, a, a little device where if you play a tone near a pay phone, you get a free phone call. Because the phone companies used to use in-band signaling to pay for all phone calls, um, which I find amusing because today the students in the class, they, they kind of go, what's a phone call? Um, uh, but if you play this, uh, this tone, it happens to be 2600 hertz, uh, the phone company at the time would indicate that as, oh, you've paid the long distance fee, we're going to connect your call. Um, this was all fine and dandy until Captain Crunch cereal uh, issued uh, millions of free whistles to school children that just happened to be 2600 hertz. Uh, so suddenly every preteen could get a free phone call by just blowing into this whistle. Um, now this was intentionally demodulating. What this means is the phone company was intentionally looking for this tone and then it would trigger this no notion of, okay, it's been paid for. What we're about to talk about is a different regime and that is where we send in tones where the system never intended to hear the tones in the first place. And we're going to trick these systems into, just like we had created an unintentional radio receiver with uh, the pacemaker uh, and the microphone, here we're creating an unintentional acoustic receiver. So it's not using radio waves, but we're sending in sound waves uh, that are now going to get misinterpreted um, uh, as signals. So um, what I've got set up here on my Mac uh, is it's got a little Bluetooth link. Uh, this is a software oscilloscope. It's got a Bluetooth link to my um, Samsung smartphone. And we're going to play a YouTube video. You can go look at this YouTube video online if you want. Um, just don't play it if you have a Samsung Galaxy S5. Um, but what's going to happen, uh, this is the first uh, musical virus that I'm aware of, but if you play this video on your phone, uh, it co-ops the speaker phone of your smartphone as the adversarial transmitter. It transmits these sound waves that then um, uh, are mechanically coupled to your circuit board and propagate to your sensor that are on the same circuit board at the resonance of that particular uh, accelerometer, such that not only can we interfere with the accelerometer, but we can control the actual value of, of the uh, accelerometer's uh, output uh, delivered into the microprocessor. So uh, we'll just play this uh, high quality video here. All right, so what's going on here? Um, if you look carefully and you use your imagination, it's spelling out the word walnut. Um, uh, I've always wanted my oscilloscope to talk with me in the empty lab, and uh, I got my dream. And um, so the, the students first submitted, the, for anyone submitting to CCS today, uh, it's always hard to prove to the reviewers that your experiment works. We used to just say, here are the values of the output of the oscilloscope. It kept getting rejected, so we said, OK, let's spell words out. And so I said, pick all letters that are functions, uh, not relations. And so W-A-L-N-U-T happened to be functions in capitals. Um, but what the music video is demonstrating is that um, the normal sound coming from whatever you use as cover traffic doesn't actually have any impact on the sensor because it's not at resonance. The, the music uh, from good old Rick isn't at resonance of, uh, of the sensor. Uh, so you can add in uh, other tones, um, and sometimes you can actually add in ultrasonic tones that are inaudible and you wouldn't even know uh, that your sensor is being interfered with. Um, and as usual, it's just being blindly ported up the chain to the microprocessor um, without any way to validate the uh, integrity of the sensor reading. So why does this work? Um, it has to do with the physics of the semiconductors, and you'll find this in all sorts of stuff today. Um, accelerometers and gyroscopes are um, fairly well studied at this point on the computer security. Uh, there's um, some work on uh, clocks uh, that don't use a crystal but instead use MEMS technology. Um, but all it is is a mechanical system shrunk down to the size of silicon and then packaged in a chip. Um, and there are all sorts of interesting reliability issues like how the silicon sticks to itself on the inside when it's vibrating. And all these sound waves are sort of tickling the worst case scenarios of the reliability issues of the MEMS products. Um, so, um, Tim, who uh, was the graduate student who did this work, um, sort of cataloged just dozens of accelerometers, and I want to go through just a little bit of, of the physics. Um, so, um, uh, it, it, let, let me try to unpack this, of what's going on. This is one particular accelerometer, and uh, on the left-hand side, what he's done is he's, he's swept 
every, pretty much every frequency from near zero uh, hertz all the way up to ultrasound, 30 kilohertz. And for each frequency, um, he's taking several measurements to say, hey, what's coming out of the accelerometer's output? And um, if there's no interference, you would expect it to be zero, right? Because the accelerometer is just sitting on a table, the acceleration output should be zero. But for instance, in this case, at five kilohertz, suddenly we get a huge standard deviation. That means over the many, many trials, we're getting all wildly different output coming out of the accelerometer. That's not supposed to happen. So he knows, okay, that's probably the resonant frequency of the semiconductor materials themselves. Um, and, and I'll show you how we use this to create this uh, unintentional uh, demodulator. Um, the second one is a little more confusing to parse. This is the, the mean shift. So again, he's sweeping all these different frequencies as he's dancing through the different tones. Um, but now he's plotting what is the average value. So for instance, at around 4 kilohertz, he did many, many, many trials. And you would expect, even if you hit some kind of weird interference, you would expect the mean to be zero. Because uh, you know, you're probably causing uh, an interference to go high just as much as you're causing it to go low. But he actually found the opposite. He found that for certain frequencies that were not the same, um, they would just, for some reason, always be biased um, to one particular higher value. And so that was a little bit harder to understand, but we'll, we'll try to walk through that. But basically, um, what's going on here from a signals perspective is um, uh, some set of tones cause the output of accelerometers to suddenly fluctuate like an AC output. Um, and other uh, accelerometers have a different design flaw, which causes a constant chosen output from the accelerometer, uh, a DC offset. So um, let's walk through what's going on here. Um, and if you're not a MEMS person or a circuit person, don't worry, this will be pretty quick. Um, so um, normally what happens is there's something called a signal processing chain. It's, it's every signal that comes into a circuit goes through a very formulaic process. You, you first have a sensing mass that vibrates, uh, but computers don't like to work on mechanical things, so they first like to convert it into voltages. So it, it gets a, an abstract representation as voltages. Um, it gets amplified because typically these signals are really, really tiny, and uh, it's not yet at logic level, so you amplify it up. Um, but when you amplify it, you're also amplifying all the noise. So typically there's what's called a low-pass filter uh, to get rid of um, all the high-frequency weird noise. And then it's digitized using something called an analog-to-digital converter. <laughs> so normally when you don't have interference, it just works fine. Um, you'll magically get this output, and then your software stack or your embedded uh, systems uh, firmware writer will then um, interpolate that into some kind of digital value of, let's say, temperature or acceleration. But there are two common flaws that uh, we found in the design of semiconductors. Um, one is a, a low-pass filter that's overly permissive. It just lets through a lot of high frequencies, even, even though it shouldn't. And the other is an amplifier that does something called asymmetric clipping. So um, when you send in interference, um, that's uh, at, at resonance of uh, the mechanics of the system, and you have a low-pass filter that just lets everything through, well, it's kind of not doing any filtering, and so it just lets this very high-frequency signal through to the output of, of the, in this case, the accelerometer. And so you get these fluctuating measurements coming out. And we can co-opt that uh, if we know a little bit about um, uh, aliasing, uh, and if we know a little bit about the sampling rate of the interrupt handler in the firmware, you can begin to control the output of the accelerometer. The third case is, was uh, really complicated, and um, uh, we had a hypothesis. We, we were only able to, able to validate it after meeting with the manufacturers who just confirmed, yes, that makes sense. Um, but it turns out some amplifiers are kind of crappy. Um, if you send in a signal that's too high, they're going to clip off the sine waves, but only at the tops or only at the bottoms of the waves. And when you send this through a low-pass filter, it does the work for you, and magically, the, alternate, the, the AC signal goes away, and you're left with a DC offset. And you can sort of tune this DC offset um, so you can have a constant shifted uh, output of that accelerometer. So these are the two tools uh, that we have at our disposal um, in order to control the output. And so here's just one example uh, where we, we want to see the red uh, as the desired output. We modulate it on top of a carrier signal at resonance, kind of like an AM radio, but acoustic. and um, that's what it looks like when you send it out. This is what it looks like um, uh, when you actually measure the output of the accelerometer. Th these are actual uh, readings. Okay, uh, and that's from this flaw in the constant output. 
Uh, again, this is uh, because of a flaw in the amplifier that's doing asymmetric clipping. But the other case is where you have a crappy low-pass filter, and um, good old Nyquist, if you remember that from your signals courses, uh, if you don't sample at twice the rate of your expected signal you're trying to decode, you're going to get what's called aliasing, you're going to misinterpret what signal's actually there. Um, so to illustrate that, if you uh, imagine we're sending in this blue signal uh, as the adversary, and then we have an interrupt handler on our embedded system that's sampling the accelerometer at some rate, the um, computer, the software stack, misinterprets the red signal as being reality, where in fact that's not reality. It's, it's a alias lower frequency submultiple of the actual uh, adversarial signal. But when the adversary knows um, the interrupt handler's rates or what's sort of equivalent to the refresh rate of like a monitor, you can deliberately send your adversarial signal such that it's always going to be at a peak or a trough or, or some phase shift from that when the interrupt handler hits. And then the computer is none the wiser and just thinks, oh, it's a constant output. This is a little trickier to do. Um, now, the, the interesting part to me was the fix. Um, to solve this problem, um, normally uh, what happens in the computer security research field, somebody discovers a vulnerability and the manufacturer says, oh, install this software update. Um, instead, for this particular case, the manufacturer said, drill your holes differently. So there's no software to update. Um, and to illustrate this, Analog Devices, who's now one of our sponsors, um, what they say is um, the printed circuit board basically acts like a drum. And when the wave front hits it, it starts to bounce up and down, and there are a couple ways you can cause the missensing, but one of the ways is it causes the chip just to move up and down. It gives it sort of a false secondary acceleration. So um, this doesn't fix all the problems, but their solution is, again, drill holds differently. So you drill the mount points as close as possible to the, uh, where you mounted the sensor, because that makes a very rigid drum, and that drives the resonant frequency up into the ultrasonic range, which is a lot harder for an adversary to do. Uh, they also recommend what's called trenching, where you cut the circuit board literally in half. Um, so if you have an emitter on your circuit board, like a smartphone, you cut it so that you don't get this mechanical coupling between your emitters and your sensors. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this is causing just benign errors. In fact, one of the manufacturers, when we displayed this, they said, oh, that's why when we were using our sensors in the airbags, that whenever we honked the horn, the airbag would miss, uh, you know, malfunction. Um, and it was because the horn just happened to be at resonance. So trench. Um, sine waves, okay. Um, so there are a few other uh, solutions you can try if, if you can't redrill the holes in your smartphone. Um, there are actually some software approaches. Um, one is to randomize your interrupt handler. Because it turns out, if you're expecting a fairly smooth and constant signal, and I would hope your acceleration is fairly smooth and constant, unless you're out of control in space, um, the, uh, you, you can sample at any point in the phase of whatever period you're looking at, and you'll probably get a very similar value of what you'd have gotten anyway had you sampled periodically. By getting rid of the periodicity, you make it very hard for the adversary to exploit the aliasing property. Um, so, let's see, I think... Uh, is it uh, till 10 or so? Or? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about some other acoustic work that's a little more recent, and that is uh, hard drives. Um, uh, uh, we get all of our inspiration from YouTube videos. So um, uh, uh, this fellow was um, angry at his data center, and um, he was yelling at his hard drives. And um, he noticed that whenever he yelled at his hard drives, his I.O. throughput would drop precipitously. Um, so his hard drives were very sensitive. And um, uh, uh, it was all fun. And everybody was sending this video around to everybody in the storage community. But then, um, then this article came out. Um, a bank shut down for 10 hours because when they did a test of their klaxon of their fire alarm, suddenly all their hard drives failed. So what's going on there? It seems a little weird. Again, a reliability issue. Um, so uh, one of my students uh, decided, let, let's, you know, I wonder what's the availability property of hard drive, and what's the physics behind why this is going on, and then can we do it intentionally, and then how would we defend against it? So the threat model is, imagine you've got a notebook or a data center with hard drives in it, and you've got built-in speakers. And because you have built-in speakers, you've got mechanical coupling, so all you need is an adversary who can trick you into going to a website that plays music. Uh, but you can also place a speaker nearby. Um, so, uh, or ultrasonic emitters as well. So, um, what's going on inside a magnetic hard drive? It's got a spinning disk, it's got a head stack assembly that seeks over the disk, and it's spinning, you know, typically around 7,000 RPMs. Um, so here's what's going on 
when you send out um, a rather high tone, um, uh, this is a, a physics simulation of how the hard drive works in a sort of a static sense. And um, uh, what this is representing is the deflection. So when you send in a 120 decibel source to the hard drive, um, the, the hard drive, the, the spinning platter itself begins to deform. And the red is about 500 nanometers. Now the precision of a hard drive, you might call it the needle, but it's the headstack assembly, it needs on the order of like two to five nanometers of precision to read and write properly. So if you're flexing this thing 500 nanometers, it's well outside of its operating specification range. So what's going, so you would think that, well, if you, uh, you know, why does this happen? Well, this is why we have um, parked the hard drive head when uh, the notebook senses it's falling off a table, it parks the hard drive so you don't scratch it. Um, but what we're going to do here is trick it into parking the hard drive and other things even when you're not falling. So when the sound is off, your hard drive is working uh, just normally, but the moment you turn the sound on, uh, you begin to cause this deformation in, in the platters uh, to the point where it exceeds the thresholds of proper reading and writing. So it's a little hard to see but you've got about a 10% uh, error tolerance for reading and writing, those um, sort of light blue colors in the center. But when we turn the sound on, suddenly the um, head stack assembly is just all over the place. This is measuring the percent off from the center of the track where the, the, the needle is supposed to be, and it's well outside. Um, so when that happens, the reading and writing just stops. So um, if you're an embedded systems programmer, how would you solve this? Well, you get a little piece of flash memory and you buffer stuff because you think, well, this is probably just a temporary problem. Let's mask the errors so the operating system writers don't even need to think about it. Don't even make them aware this is going on. But if you have flash memory, you eventually run out of buffer space. Then what happens? Well, it's unspecified. So most hard drive manufacturers seem to just dump the data on the floor um, and then don't tell the operating system. So uh, here's what happens when you turn on the sound on your hard drive. The throughput will drop uh, precipitously. Uh, when you get to even higher um, uh, uh, volume tones, it just stops the reading and writing entirely. But this is um, uh, uh, very frequency sensitive. So one of the first things we did was, again, we swept all the frequencies to figure out what tones uh, do hard drives really hate the most, kind of like scratching a chalkboard. Uh, turns out that around 18,000 kilohertz, which is within the human audible range, uh, although above my hearing, um, will um, easily cause a hard drive to stop functioning at below um, uh, 100, uh, 100 decibels. So um, that's one of the ways that hard drives malfunction, and I'll get to some of the consequences in a moment. But then there's a second way. It turns out when you drop your notebook, and I know nobody here has ever done that, um, when you drop your notebook, there are typically two or three piezoelectric sensors on there that are, look, that are called shock sensors. Um, and when the shock sensor gets triggered, it parts the hard drive so you don't lose your data. Um, well, it just happens to be that they have resonant frequencies in the ultrasonic range. Um, and so if you send <laughs> ultrasonic tones to the hard drive, it will just stop the hard drive uh, immediately and throughput goes to zero. So where this gets a little interesting from an application standpoint would be things like um, surveillance. So one of the first things the students did was um, uh, they got a, a surveillance grade hard drive and uh, Barbara is about to play a video um, where you won't hear it because it's only recording the video, but she's about to play some tones in the laboratory and you'll see a minute and a half of video suddenly disappears. Um, so she's starting a timer and after about 12 seconds the buffer space in the hard drive runs out because it's, it's buffering all the video frames but the music, the sound wave, is stopping it from writing. So at about uh, 12 seconds or so you're going to see it cut out a minute and a half uh, of video. Uh, so this stopped the recording of the video, and it's going to rewind a second, you'll see what's going on. Um, but again, this is just playing a tone, and it causes the hard drive to fail silently, and the operating system doesn't even realize it. Um, so this is sort of tickling, again, undefined behavior where embedded systems engineers aren't too familiar with how to handle weird physics of, of the hard drive. Um, some of the other interesting things that can happen when you play tones near your, your hard drive is, um, we had a gigabyte hard drive, and after we played one tone, Suddenly, the hard drive thought it had uh, 2,000 petabytes of capacity. <laughs> so we were thinking of patenting this discompression software. Uh, so we still don't know what's causing all this, but uh, we've seen physical scratching on the hard drive as well when we've opened up and done an autopsy. Um, uh, uh, also, sometimes the uh, operating system will just spontaneously reboot, but I guess that's what Windows does. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, crap. Okay. Um, so you know, I think the harder part is defending against this because like the hacking into things is like high attention, but defending stuff you're never going to hear about. But I think is more important. Um, so the, the first approach was just spray uh, uh, foam on it because we thought, well, we'll do the cheap thing. But it, it actually didn't work. We were surprised because um, some of the tones actually bend around the foam, uh, the foam, and also foam traps heat. And so very quickly it reached the uh, maximum operating temperature for the specification. So don't do that. Um, bad idea. The better idea is think about control theory. And you know, you fly an airplane that's just horribly, um, uh, you know, out of control. But it, it's dynamically in control because it's constantly adjusting. And so what hard drives do is they have what's called a PI controller. And it's constantly sensing when the hard drive is a little bit off the center of track, and then it magnetizes a voice coil or an electromagnet to push the head back into the center of the track. Um, that's what they do today. Um, but because the adversary is sinusoidal, since the adversary is always trying to be at resonance, this means you can predict exactly what the adversary is going to do in the future based upon some of the sound waves you're sensing now. So if you add just a very simple second attenuation controller that's doing this predictive what's the adversary about to inject into me, you can actually energize the electromagnet ahead of time at the resonance and then cause that attenuation to disappear. So this is a simulation, but you can see the, uh, the head stack is just all over the place from the center. The moment you add this um, a second PI controller, you actually get it within the guardrail. So the reading and writing actually succeeds. Um, now, I don't know about reliability. Probably we're wearing out the hard drive mechanics more quickly this way because it's, it's kind of like driving with your foot on both the accelerometer and the brake at the same time. Um, but it, at least it gets the reads and writes to work. Only using a software update. Bad news. So after we discovered that there's this um, feedback controller that tells you the position error signal, how many nanometers off the center of the track you are, another student said, well, wait a minute, that's a microphone. Um, so he's turned hard drives into microphones. Um, so be careful what you say. So I want to play, he's actually going to um, give this talk on Monday in San Francisco. Let me play his preview talk. You have to listen carefully. So I'm going to skip to a little bit uh, forward. Um, but basically, if you're building a system that depends upon sensors, you need to find a way to verify. You need to find a way to verify uh, its integrity. Um, I think some of the things we can do in the university system is really demystify the attack surface. So instead of testing the compliance, you test a failure. Um, so I'm, I don't care if your system works. I just want to know when it fails. Um, also, um, I think some of the, going to the bottom bullet, um, rethinking some of the integrated circuits and some of the hardware-software agreements can be very helpful. If the hardware can convey just a little bit of extra hint information to the software stack on why to trust the output, I think we're going to be able to get rid of a lot of these problems. So if you can get the sensor just to tell me, for instance, hey, have you vibrated at your residence recently? That tells me a lot. Like maybe I shouldn't trust the output of your sensor, and I should go to a second or a third sensor and take a boat. Um, but these problems have been around forever, and I would just say, uh, you know, maybe it's not a good idea to put a computer in everything. So you know, IoT and everything, maybe not. Um, but if we do, we need to have an eye toward the safety and the integrity. Um, I'll, uh, you can read these papers another time, but um, I'll just uh, add with, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in security research at the analog level. Uh, if you're a student, there's just two things missing. Uh, you are. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at solving some of these problems in analog sensor security. There's going to be plenty more problems to solve. But um, thanks for having me.